Hello, hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers Sunday Sermon. This is for us. I'm David Johnson. Let's get started with our other host, Mac. How you doing? I'm doing good, David. How's your week? Uh, yeah. How you doing? <laughs> doing good. Doing good. <laughs> well, it was one of those weeks. It was one of those weeks. <laughs> oh, sorry to hear. Um, turbulent, turbulent health wise, turbulent work wise. But um, you know what? That's what weekends are for to recover from such uh, things. It just dawned on me. Uh, you're going to have to start doing uh, the introduction of the show at least every other week. Oh, uh, yeah. Do you keep things fair? Yeah, I mean, really, I the first first voice people hear doesn't necessarily need to be mine. Furthermore, the way I introduce the show, there's nothing canonical about that. I change it up whenever I feel like it. So you can introduce the show any way you want it to. <laughs> so, All right, let's, let's see how people, <laughs> how, see how how about, people respond. Yeah. How about next week? Uh, come up with something. Uh, uh, I have to think of something. Oh, that's short notice. Um, Short okay. a week? Oh, you're, 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 literally, you've been yeah. saying hello um, since you were a wee lad. You can say hello, <laughs> welcome to the show, and that's it. I feel like I have to make sure. it more special. Why? Um, <laughs> Why? No one expects you to be me. They expect you to be the same one. <laughs> they expect okay. me to be me. <laughs> you, no, like, I mean, like something that's never been done in history ever like okay. just you know you just be a good host be because like I, this how many podcasts are there so many uh no i do yeah um look bro you're gonna you're gonna work it out in fact it's probably gonna be whatever you think you've planned when the when the hot light is on it's all gonna leave your head anyway <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I know just about trust that. Me, don't over plan any of this stuff. <laughs> it's not going right. to matter. <laughs> so, um, so, that said, um, we have a very interesting uh, topic to discuss. It is, in fact, the first show I wanted to do, but I realized it really wouldn't be fair to start with this first because people really need it to you know see you know bring in a new host and a new for s with some familiar things and some familiar faces and uh some familiar topics and we just kind of get used to talking to each other on the mic uh before we actually jump into the show the show and uh, this week is going to be a a show um and i can't wait I want to talk about Calvinism, uh, first of all, because I'm pretty sure you're some brand of Calvinism. Second of all, there are brands of Calvinism. <laughs> and so whatever people think about Calvinism and you, they're wrong uh, because there are, there are mix and match flavors. And we're going to find out a little bit more about Calvinism proper. And we're going to find out a little bit more about Calvinism Mac attack. And we might even find a little out a little bit more about Calvinism, David Johnson, because there was a time. This is a very oh. uh, little known thing. There was a time when I strongly considered going full ass Calvinism when I was a Christian. Oh, um, yeah. But you it, just couldn't do it. You're like, nope. No, I couldn't do it. <laughs> But, but I did feel a compulsion <laughs> and I did study it. I looked into it uh, as much as someone from the outside uh, can look into it. I, I you know, tried to do my due, due diligence with it. And to this day, I think that uh, Calvinists, even the most strictest of Calvinists have a point. And I have some Calvinistic sympathies. I also happen to think that Calvinism is the most awful brand of Christianity that there is. But that has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I think it is at least suggested in maybe half the Bible. Wow. I think it's it's all the Bible, but um, uh, it's one of those topics where 
it's hard to get what someone is saying. So for instance, I think it's it's an awful idea to have a discussion with someone on the internet, like on YouTube or whatever, about Calvinism, because 99% of the time, you're talking about two different things. Um, so even right now, when you say Calvinism, I'm tempted, like I've been tempted for the last 10 minutes to like, what do you mean by Calvinism? Like, how do you understand it? Right. Um, exactly. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today. I think that we're going to figure out how we understand it. And you might, you might discover that I'm a lot less dogmatic about many things theologically than, than you think. And I think a lot of times I get more dogmatic on the discussion board just because of the nature of internet discussions. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's fun to carve out a position and then try to defend it. <laughs> uh, it I, I, the older I get, the more I realize that it's not fun anymore. Like I used to, <laughs> I used to enjoy like having discussions with people. It could be like, and we could end on, on, on good terms. And they'll be like, yeah, I guess, you know, like, thanks for the discussion. But the older I get, maybe I'm the one who's changing, but I realize people are more, uh, like it's just so toxic online about yeah. anything. Honestly, it's like you. So like when I see someone say, "Oh, I'm sorry, you, yeah, you're right about that," I'm surprised. I'm like, "Whoa, this is rare." You know, someone admitting they're wrong. Yeah. Well, look, um, when you when you apologized and said that you were wrong about uh, my being a hyper skeptic, I just wanted to skip over it. I mean, my, my mind did, it does not compute. Uh, what are you doing, man? That's not, that's not what we do. <laughs> You're trying to break me. Uh, so, so yeah, no, I, I agree. And I love a good, honest discussion. And I, I, there are people that I have good, hard, honest discussions uh, about things. And I can admit all of my, my intellectual and theological vulnerabilities, but there's something polarizing about internet conversations that just don't allow you to do that as easily. Mm. And uh, so I, there, there are plenty of times and plenty of positions where I might, you know, look back over a conversation after a week has passed on a, on a discussion on a board and think, yeah, I kind of wish I had some of that back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel that honestly, I feel that with like all, <laughs> everything I say. <laughs> I mean, it's you know not, what I'm it's, talking about. I do. I know exactly sometimes, what you're talking about. Sometimes I'm like, oh man, because it's uh, it's really hard to get thrown across because um, you can be passionate and be compassionate at the same time. But when you're reading it uh, from like, let's say, like an AI was reading it, they'll be like, wow, this person is very angry. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't come across. It doesn't come across like like maybe Chat GPT will have something to do with it, like you put it in and say, hey, make this sound like a nice grandma is saying it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like a nine-year-old grandma is saying it. I should run all my comments through that. And then, so. <laughs> and then post it and they'll be like, who is this person? I think that's what Brian B does. Cause I yeah. don't think, I don't think he's the <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> what we've decided is that everything that we post on the internet, I'm just dragging uh, Dale in here too, and Darren. The the four of us, everything we post on the internet needs to be edited by Brian. <laughs> no, these days you can make an AI. Like we could take all all Brian's he comments. He is an AI. He is. <laughs> <Didn't> he? <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to filter all these comments. And then everyone will sound like they live on the uh, they live with Miss Daisy or something, or you know, that they're having a good day all the time. Yeah. Well, this is because this is going to be. I'm going to tell yeah. you, this is going to be one of these discussions where I, I'm I'm going to suppress my dogmatic tendencies because I really have, you know, with my theological hat on. It's really it, some some days I think, yeah, the Bible is full on Calvinist, and other thing other days I think that could be, that couldn't be further from what's being said. And so I'd like to, to introduce before I start, uh, before I roll the tape, we're only going to actually do about five minutes of this. <laughs> of this well, we, video. Do, we have to do all of it. We have to do all of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do at least the tulip today. Uh, and we're going to cover, we're going to cover that. Uh, 
we might have to pick up the rest of it next week. I got, I got stuff to do. My wife, she's, gotcha. she wants me to do things. Um, right. So this is my, this is my idea of the spectrum, uh, that gets covered. So there is, um, there is partial, there's a kind of a, the progressive, the liberal Calvinism where, um, we have, uh, all, or at least a lot of the, the responsibility to do what we must do for salvation. And we have full libertarian free will. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of throwing some ideas together. And as we talk about this, I'll show you how the, the scale works in my head. So that's one end of the continuum. And on the other end of the continuum, you have full, uh, hairy chested, uh, Calvinism, uh, where you do none of the work and there is zero libertarian free will. Effectively. Um, yeah. Uh, so I would, I would say just because I, I'm in the tradition. So I, I obviously interacted with folks of all stripes and colors, but I would say consistently, there is no Calvinist who would say that human beings in their sinful state have a libertarian free will because having a libertarian free will means doing what you want to do whenever. So it, so it, it could mean, uh, being able to be sinless, like going your entire life without telling a lie or or just doing anything wrong. That's what it means to have libertarian free will. Right. So like even on both spe spectrums, the, the guy who's the most uh, liberal, um, he takes it past the limits. And the other person uh, on the other end perhaps is like more, like they're at the fringes, they're right at the edge of leaving. Right. So I think that both of the things that I outlined are extremes. Uh, but I put them on the continuum so that everything inside can be contained within, uh, clearly identified extremes. So I'm not going to, I don't deny what you have said, but there are, there are actual traditions that, you know, aren't called Calvinism, but are kind of in this range of, you know, Calvinism and Arminianism and, uh, the reformed tradition, which is a, a thing and then a lot of other things uh that have to do with um uh, free will and uh god's uh pre pre knowledge and predestination of things kind of fit in there so if, just as just as an example yeah. when people talk about reformed uh tradition what are they talking about so they're pretty much referring to the uh so we have to go back all the way to the protestant reformation that happened in the 16th century with Martin Luther and his whole, you know, beef with the Roman Catholic Church where he was trying to reform them. And then they said no thanks and they kicked him out. And he was, you know, like, OK, let's let's reform. Let's have some churches that teach actual uh, theology. And, you know, you have the five solas. I'm sure you've heard of them. Right. Um, so someone who affirms the five solas is a Protestant. Um, and so the reformed tradition, which I'm a part of, um, we affirm those but we distinguish ourselves from lutherans in the sense that our soteriology which is what we're talking about when we talk about calvinism is more systematized mm -hmm. whereas lutherans they leave a lot up to mystery mm -hmm. so that's why uh even anglicans um so there's this i don't know if you've uh heard of this that like when the reformation happened there were like three branches there were three streams so it was happening all over europe it was happening in germany and also in england and so in england that's when you have you have the church of england which is anglicans and then you have lutherans in germany and then uh right there in switzerland that's where you and and the netherlands you have the reformed so it was like three branches happening all over europe so uh those are the main streams of the protestant reformation so reform the reformed tradition comes from that third stream 
of, uh, of Christians in places like France and Switzerland and uh, the Netherlands, and they they follow a more systematized uh, way of understanding uh, doctrine in the Bible, as opposed to Lutherans who also have their own systems, but they uh, they leave a lot up to mystery. So, uh, consistently speaking, Anglicans, Lutherans, and if you want to call them uh, the Reformed. Uh, have the same view of, of salvation like we we all agree on the beginning and the end of salvation okay so we're gonna we're gonna get into that because we're definitely going to cover uh tulip but okay. um just while you're while you've got your professor hat on where does <laughs> where, where does armenian uh fit into all of this all right so there's a big misconception that uh the guy who is named after that. So Jacob Arminius, he was actually a student of John Calvin. He, uh, he, he learned at one of Calvin's schools and the guy said that his favorite Bible commentator is John Calvin. Like you can look it up. Uh, so take that Arminians. Uh, just kidding. Uh, the thing is he died. And then the year after the students of this guy, Jacob Arminius were like, hold on a second. We we've got a bit of a problem with some of the things that uh john calvin taught and we see that when we look at tulip uh we see some of that so the thing is that arminius himself he agreed with the t of tulip and he he kind of agreed with the p so his biggest uh uh problem i would say his biggest uh, disagreement was the u the l the i and mm -hmm. and historic um, Armenians are like that. Like if you're, someone is a is an Armenian, that they have to like uh, affirm the T and also the P. Uh, but these days, you find people saying, "Oh, I'm an Armenian, but I reject all five. and that's just not historically correct. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. Interweaved in this um, is the idea of determinism versus uh, libertarian free will. Um, I, I, this is not going to be that show. Uh, <laughs> no, I, please no. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but it's it also can't be completely ignored because it's it's a big part of it. Um, it it's one of those underlying threads uh, that kind of Id identifies a person's position. So we're gonna we're gonna get into that a little bit, but only. Uh, you know, just the hair of the surface um, with that. Uh, but I, I just want to say that and prepare you for that because some of my thoughts are there. So at the heart of TULIP, TULIP is the, uh, the acronym um, that we will go over. I'll just let the video go over it. But it's, it's the, it is yeah. at the heart of TULIP is a doctrine of grace. Uh, and so I'd say for the whole sorry sorry to cut you off let's mm -hmm. say the whole thing is it's predicated on grace grace and t-t-u-i-l-i-p mm -hmm. yeah. yeah in fact i was i was just going to say all of calvinism as i understand calvinism is just a very muscular doctrine of grace it is <laughs> it is yeah yeah it, it is uh you know I, I think i used the word a little while ago hairy chested is the hairiest of chested doctrines of grace that you can get in fact it is extreme grace <laughs> uh as opposed to um you know a lot of protestant protestantism is protestantism which you know they think they have a very strong doctrine of grace but it's just because they don't understand calvinism <laughs> so yeah so, so the thing is so the problem is uh these days uh you'll hear like all these oh, these debates are so awful but uh and they lack grace most of the time but the thing is historically like even guys like john wesley who like founded the methodist church like he was very strong on like grace is necessary mm -hmm. like you need to have god's grace in order for you to believe and he was like an arminian and he was this guy who went around preaching all over the place uh and he was like okay by your own strength you can't do anything without the grace of god uh preceding you and so the same thing is 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 in the Anglican Church. If you read the thirty-nine articles of the 
Anglican Church, you'll see it there. The articles of the American Methodists, you'll find it there. Uh, so it's it's like grace is there, but like you see, like like you said, Calvinism is more like it puts it puts grace at the foreground, whereas other Christians put it maybe at the back, like all the way in the back. It's like, okay, man's free will, and then grace, maybe we'll talk about grace at the end. <laughs> whereas Calvinism like, is like, no, grace comes first, it's in the middle, and it's in the end, and it's like you can draw a straight line through it. So it's grace, 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 grace. Yeah, right. Um, in fact, I would, uh, some might say uncharitably, describe Calvinism's grace as an inch wide and a mile deep, and everyone else's grace as a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, be uh, because they, I think that most Christians, the impulse is to try to, to make the tent too big, too wide, to make um, the elect too broad, um, to cover too many people. <laughs> uh, and, and too many situations. And so as a result, it, it becomes very shallow. It's a very shallow kind of grace, but Calvinism is complete. However, it doesn't cover everybody. It's, it's not a universalist doctrine or anywhere close to a universalist doctrine. There, there are the elect. And so for the people that it covers, it covers completely. Uh, and so that's why I would describe it as you know, an inch, an inch wide, a mile deep, as opposed to the others, a mile wide and an inch oh, deep. Yeah. So that's, that's why I'm using that terminology there. So without any further ado, let's just get, let's, let's do five minutes of this video. I'm actually going to stop it like five times okay. <laughs> um, All right. as it, as it just briefly describes each letter of the T. Um, and we're going to, we're going to say our piece and okay. hit the, can you believe we've been talking for like 30, 30 minutes? I don't believe that. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, uh, my fantasy of doing this in an hour, uh, bust it. Maybe an hour and a half. Let's uh, see what we're Okay, let's, yeah, let's watch the video. Welcome to Real Talk with Jordan Riley, where the real talk does not come from me. It comes directly from God's word. And before we get started today, please consider subscribing to our channel, giving this a thumbs up, and supporting what we do by going to realtalkwithjordan.com. On today's episode, we're going to be asking a question that so many people have hotly debated for decades, if not centuries, and that is, is Calvinism biblical? Now, before you want to turn the channel, please stay with me because there's going to be a lot of information discussed. And I think when we get to the end, you're going to see things maybe even a little bit different. So are you ready? Let's go. I could have just skipped all that. <laughs> The five points of Calvinism can be summarized by the acronym TULIP. T stands for total depravity. U for unconditional election. L for limited atonement. I for irresistible grace. And P for perseverance of the saints. So there's just a quick little introductory look at what Calvinism is. But we're going to go a lot deeper. And we're going to answer three questions. Question number one is, again, what is Calvinism? What is it really all about? Number two, we're going to ask, why do people reject it? And number three, we're going to ask, are you a closet Calvinist? Oh, ho. <laughs> okay. So uh, before we yeah. jump into Tulip, I just want to say that last one is obviously very, uh, it is meant to be inflammatory, <laughs> but, I, it, but it actually might be one of the best questions uh, he asks, because I think a yeah. lot of Christians who don't identify as Calvinists have a lot of Calvinist ideology. Uh, oh, and, yeah, for sure. Theology. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, I, uh, when I was really thinking about Calvinism, it wasn't because, oh, here's a new thing that I should study. Oh, there, there it is. It's, you know, with the bits and pieces I knew of Calvinism, I started to realize, wait a minute, <laughs> a lot of what I believe feels very Calvinist, and I don't think I feel good about that. <laughs> So. It's such a it's such a dirty word to say. Like even even at the church I go to, my church, like it's like when you mention it, it's like you 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 run the risk of offending someone, and it's and it's like okay, um, but you know, like it. So 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 if you affirm it, it's it, it it, and I know you've probably heard this before, but it's a doctrine that just humbles you completely. 
Yeah. Um, and if and it's 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 like some people who learn about it and they're like they affirm it for the first time, it becomes this huge thing for them. It's like I can't believe no one else believes this. And so they become what you call cage stage Calvinists, where they go around bashing other Christians and saying, you're just saying you believe that you're saved by your own works. And it's like, no, that's not the way you go about it. It's it's one of those doctrines where, like, I believe you, it has to be imported to you by grace, by God, the Holy Spirit, because it's not something that someone can just wake up and be like, okay, I see it. Like, I, I know very few people who have been like, when I read the Bible, I saw it immediately or I affirmed it immediately. It's, it's, it's a very difficult doctrine to uh, accept. Right. And the uh, second speaker in this video that we're not definitely not going to get to today um, talks a lot about the humility of it, uh, which I agree with entirely. The problem and people listening to this are thinking Calvinism, humility. <laughs> Calvin wasn't humble. <laughs> um, none, of these, none of these reformers were humble. Uh, so uh, bump they that. We were pretty nice guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, then, and then we have representatives today like Seitz and Bergen, Kate, and uh, oh, the, the presuppositionalists uh, of today. And, uh, you know, what we, what we see is, oh, okay, that's Calvinism. Um, no, I, I want to say that the people who are the most public Calvinists, like even in this video, there's John, John MacArthur is in there. Um, people would say like John MacArthur is not reformed, which is a whole different discussion. But in terms of like Calvinism and, and the people who are most outspoken about it, um, just the way they go about things, it's very, it's, it, it can be very, very off-putting. Um, uh, and, and, and that's why, like, anytime I see uh, a James White debate, I'm always kind of, oh, man, this is, I don't know, like, maybe someone generally does get helped. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm certain of that. But for the most part, people see James White as, Dr. James White, as the spokesperson for Calvinism, but, like, he's not. You know, it, it's not like we, we, like, put off our representatives and be like, that's the person you go talk to. Uh, it's, yeah, but it's that's the person we know. Different. That, that's yeah, the person yeah. that we see. And so, well, you, you know, you and I, we're talking about Calvinism in terms of its humility, but it's hard to come up with representatives that are truly that way. I mean, for me, the most, one of the most humble people that I've spoken to on this show is Chris Date, who is a Calvinist, which blows my mind. So if, if you want a Calvinist that comes across as very humble and can really express the humility of uh, the movement. I would suggest, you know, listening to uh, shows where Chris Data's on. Um, I, I am many things. No one has ever accused me of overt humility. <laughs> so I've, I'm not the I'm not a good representative for anything uh, that is supposed to be humble. And um, Calvinists in general seem to be some of the most strident people there are but i i would say we're not that, yeah i would say that on that front uh people who come across that way aren't calvinisting right <laughs> they're yeah they're, they're they're baby calvinists like cage like there's a whole joke amongst us like, where we say when someone becomes a calvinist we kind of have to put them in a cage because they're always rattling off like huh i can't i, I gotta go tell everyone about this you gotta be like okay take a moment to catch your breath you know, affirm the doctrines, get your wits about you because it's a glorious do doctrine to affirm because it just, it, it, it like magnifies the scope of salvation to a, to a point that someone perhaps who grows up in, uh, in an Armenian church all their life has never really thought about it, has not seen it in the Bible. And so we have to like tell people, Hey, calm down. Don't get into arguments with people needlessly on the internet. Like if someone is opposed to you, then all right, just let them go, you know? It's not, it's not the end of the world if someone is not a Calvinist. So, yeah, yeah. Some, somebody's wrong on the internet, Mom. Um, <laughs> so, look, everybody, get your pen and paper out. You've had plenty of time to gather it up. Uh, we're about to go tulip picking. So, number one, let's get started right now. What is Calvinism? Watch this total depravity. As a result of Adam's fall, the entire human race is affected 
All humanity is dead in trespasses and sin. Man is unable to save himself. Now, this one's very important. And I'm, I'm already off the rails on this one. So <laughs> All right. um, I've thought about this one way too much in my life. And so I just have to spew a little bit <laughs> out so that uh, you can at least understand where some of the confusion is. And you might understand oh. it, but other people listening to this may not understand it. Total depravity was there not to understand. So okay. uh, lots. <laughs> um, so let me let me just let me just spew out my stream of consciousness and then I'll let you set it all straight. Okay. Uh, because this is this comes from lots of Calvinists that I've talked to and uh, listened to over the internet and read and I I this is this is just my confused position so total depravity can feel like anyway anywhere from a kind of kind of depraved kind of stained but you can but you can do it to you are screwed <laughs> no, no matter what um and so there's there's a big spectrum here and so we can say um total depravity which means there's no way for you to save yourself there's no way for you to put yourself in a right position with god on your own as a human if you are your best human you cannot devise a plan uh, to get yourself right with god okay so that's that's the first piece and i think that almost all protestants agree with that um, but then there mm, all Christians, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. there's but there are further things to consider. Okay, so you can't devise a plan. So God overcomes our total depravity by devising a plan of salvation. Here, here are things that you need to do, and now all you need to do is humble yourself before God and follow that plan. Uh, but that's not really total depravity if you can actually look at the plan agree with it and follow it so some would say no no that's you're, that's still not depraved enough <laughs> total depravity means that a god has to devise a plan and he has to be the motivating force to move your heart enough in the right direction to get you start it down the road of recognizing your sinfulness uh he uh, has to give uh, you the first push uh, -huh. uh right so and then from there you have to keep it going but no that's not depraved enough uh <laughs> for some uh and so no so what you have to do next is uh god has devised the plan he has to uh get your heart pointing in the right direction give you the push to get you started and he has to be the force that maintains you through the plan because even with that push you are still incapable of doing the rest of it on your own so total depravity where it fits in with grace is for some uh god starts a plan god gives you a plan and then you have to on your own work it out or god has to do everything for you along the way because even with all of the things god does there is no way that you can ever do any part of it and be saved and so it is all 100 percent god all of the time so that's kind of the spectrum of total uh, depravity i'd say i don't know you're not gonna like this but i'd say like that view is completely off and the reason is because it kind of misses the main point. So the main point is that what it means to be totally depraved. So I'll, I'll, I'll describe what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that every single person is as bad as they could possibly be. So it doesn't mean like uh, that Hindu lady down the street who's really nice and, and, you know, like gives you cookies and whatever. It doesn't mean that that person is like, is like the worst person they could be. What total depravity means is that sin has affected all of humanity in every single level of, our, of a person's being. So in how they think about life, in how they think about things in their heart, uh, in their mind. So sin has affected every single part of the human self. So the total there 
is not talking about the whole person. It's saying that just the totality, the totality of the human self, mind, soul, spirit has been affected by sin. And so because of that, we can't make decisions that are rightly going to be uh, oriented perfectly towards other human beings and towards God. And so what needs to happen, you mentioned, oh, you need, God needs to nudge you in a different direction or give or nudge your heart. Actually, that's, that's not correct. The, the, the way to describe it is that God needs to give you a new heart, a new nature, because the nature you got ain't good. <laughs> it, it's totally corrupted. So God has to give you a new nature. Uh, it's like when, if water gets into your engine, your car's done. It's not like, okay, I got to repair this engine. No, you got to get a new engine in your car. And total depravity says that water has gone into the, the engine of the human psyche as a whole. And so humans need new hearts. So it's not like, okay, the heart that you got is good enough and you got to, um, you know, try harder because then that means that you're not totally depraved, that there's something about you that's that's still able to respond to God. So like Lane Flowers, for example, he's very, he's so strong about this. Like he's very dogmatic. He says like, you know, the mind is still capable of mm -hmm. responding to God. You know, like how he says, he says it. Uh, but, you know, like Paul says, like uh, the, the, the natural mind, the natural man cannot accept the things of God right? mm -hmm. in Romans 8. And, and so totally depravity says that sin has affected every single part of the human psyche. It doesn't mean that people are as bad as they could be. It just means that sin has affected every single thing that makes up a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, where this fits into grace, I, it, this is, this is what I would say. I don't know that anyone else would put it this way, but once again, my understanding of this, if I'm taking total depravity seriously, is that you can't have total grace without total depravity. Uh, and, I, and I think this is why the tulip has to start this way. Because if you can do your part, quote unquote, to save yourself, then you don't need total grace. You, you just yeah, need you grace for the parts yeah. that you can't do. <laughs> that you can't do by yourself. And, and it's right. like, what parts are those? You know, how do you right. know which parts are those? Yeah. Right. And so in, in order for... In, in order to understand grace, you have to understand uh, your condition of total depravity, which is another way of saying there is nothing that you can do. It's not like God does 50% of the work and then you do the other 50%. It's not even that God does 95% and you do five of the work, 5% of the work. It's that God does 100% of the work and you are a recipient of that 100% of the work. And so, uh, as you say, God is God is not just nudging you in the right direction. He's giving you a heart transplant <clears throat> because your old heart cannot allow you to live and live being uh, a metaphor for oh, being being uh, in a right in a position right with God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. in order to live you need a total heart transplant now once you once you have that you can function as you always should have yes um, the way god intended you to be as a human being that he made in his image that that's that's the only way it can happen yeah right and so everything that you do once you have that heart transplant that's still not you that's that's simply a matter of a, a, a product of the fact that you had a heart transplant um yes. and so the stuff yeah i'm sorry to cut you off the good yeah, no, stuff no, yeah, yeah the good stuff that you do is not the basis it's not the ground that you know like god's like wow that person you know they would make a really good uh soup kitchen volunteer so i'm gonna save them it's more like that person is being a really good soup kitchen volunteer uh and that's proof that you know that's the proof that that person exactly. has been changed before before they used to like doing other things now they're you know helping people or exactly. something like that your your yeah. good works are proof that the heart transplant worked yes yes right you don't you don't um earn the heart transplant by volunteering in soup kitchens uh all, all the volunteering in soup kitchens does not actually change your heart and and, and put it in a you know the proper function as it should be and put you in right relationship with god so that's this is 
So this is total depravity as I understand, but I can, I can tell you that, um, I've spoken to many Calvinists who, uh, you know, this is why I talk about a spectrum of Calvinism, uh, would say, well, you know, maybe total depravity, not completely total. And they would describe right. it in maybe a different way. You know, God, God m gets us moving. And this is, this is maybe that spectrum, uh, between Calvinism and Arminianism where I right. think yeah. many Protestants yeah. would say, in fact, maybe most Protestants would say, uh, no, God, what God does is he works with us as we are, and he maybe provides the, the initial motivation, but he intends for us to search, you know, seek and you shall find. Well, the onus on seeking is then on us, mm. you know, that's well, what we have yeah. to do that. And we have to do it successfully and we have to do it continuously and we have to do it willingly. And if we don't do that, then we missed out on the blessings. And the Calvinists would say, you can't do that. <laughs> you can <laughs> No, actually, here's the thing. We, we can't, we won't say, uh, we won't say don't seek, you know, <laughs> we won't say don't be part of real seeker ministry. Uh, we will just say that, Hey, if you're seeking, then that's a good sign actually that God is working on your heart which is like, wait, what are you talking about? Because if, if there's even a, a, an inkling of a desire for you to know God, then that is proof that God himself is drawing himself to you, like he's drawing you to himself. Right, so but that's, that's, why but that's we, still yeah. God. That's not that's, you. That, that's still God, yeah. Right. And, and where uh, other people who are not Calvinists differ would, would say like, no, that's your free will. And it's okay. It's like okay, if your will is is tied to sin and God is holy, then your will and God can't you know like they can't be buddies. They can't be friends. They can they can't say okay, well, I'm, I'm I'm like you know like what Adam did in the garden. He ran away right after he he found out he had sinned. He went and hid himself. So the same thing is true for the human will. Like we know we're sinful. We're bad. Um, and so what we do is we run away from God. We hide ourselves, like even so that if, if God calls out to us, we're still, you know, we're still in hiding. We're like, yeah, yeah, I'm over here. But, you know, it's it's kind of your fault because you you gave me this woman or, or whatever you want to blame it on. And, and so salvation, even the seeking. So the reason that we are like telling, like encouraging people to seek God is because that in a, in and of itself is evidence that God is working in your heart. Now, it may not be the case, but it's just it's just a, it's a good case because there are lots of people that are not seeking. They're not interested for them. It's like life is on one plane to be li lived. It's it's about pleasure or it's about, you know, like carving out your own destiny or whatever. But if someone's like, OK, uh, this whole God proposition, what's it about? that in of itself is also from God. It's not from the human will. Right. So if, if we were doing, uh, an after show, I would, I would actually make a note at this point and okay. come back to, uh, explore the tension between, uh, seeking and free will. Uh, okay. I'm just, I'm going to cut myself off because of time. But if, time, we're, yeah. if we're doing an after show, uh, we, we talked about after shows um, earlier uh, before the show started, folks, so our pre-show pre chat. So Mac knows exactly what I'm talking about. This would be <laughs> this would be one of those circle backs here. Um, but uh, rather than circling back, uh, we are going to press forward. Unconditional election. Because man is dead in sin, he is unable to initiate a response to God. Therefore, in eternity past, God elected certain people to salvation. Election and predestination are unconditional. They are not based on man's response because man is unable to respond, nor does he want to. Okay, okay, all right. Um, boy, we could do an hour on this. Uh, we're not. We're not. <laughs> I'm going to show. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to show restraint uh, here. Uh, I I see this in a, in black and white terms. Um, you're either elect or you're not. Uh, if you were elect, God didn't choose you because of what you are doing now, what you will do, or in fact, what he knew you would do. He didn't choose you for that. <laughs> he chose you because he chose you. And the reason you are doing what you are doing is because he chose you to do it. Um, so that's, the, that's the 
extreme end on, on that one end. And the other end is, oh no, uh, you are saved because, uh, God knew that you would choose with your free will to do the things that you needed to do to be saved. And so that's why you're elect. It, he chose you because of you, not because of him. And so, uh, sort that out for me, Mac. Did God choose the elect despite of what a person might do? Or did he choose a person to be elect because of what he knew they would do? So the uh the historic position, like I uh, and I I'm a big uh proponent of asking people to go do the research for themselves because me telling you, oh, it's this, and then you say no, well, uh, someone else said something different would not help you. It's better if you see it for yourself. But the historic position on election has been that God himself chose a particular people. Now, it's not that the <laughs> It's not that someone being chosen for for salvation uh, now means like like let's say so okay so I'm a Christian right and and I'm like okay I'm chosen I can just chill I can do whatever I want that's not what unconditional election means what it means is that when before God ever created people or the universe or the world God had a plan and that plan involved having people who were conformed to the image of His Son Jesus Christ so these like this massive multitude of people, like God would know their names, God would know how everything would turn out in their lives. So unconditional election means, the unconditional part means it's not conditioned on what the person does or doesn't do, but rather God chose out of the sinful lump of humanity that was going to exist, God chose to save some out of a sheer act of grace. That's what it means. It, it doesn't mean that, you know, like some people like um, Molinists and um, uh, Arminians and Provisionists, whatever, they say, okay, God, uh, God looked into the future and he saw, oh, wow, Jimmy over there is going to have faith in me. So I'm going right. to elect that's, him. That's middle knowledge, right? Um, that's middle knowledge, right? Which we both detest, right? Yeah, I, um, I do. And, and, and the thing is, that doesn't, makes sense because it means that Jimmy was the decisive factor in, in salvation. Right. And the question is, you know, like, it, like someone, let's say Bob doesn't have faith. So, so God could have seen that Bob doesn't have faith and he still like, you know, like said, Oh, you're, I, you're totally, it's all totally up to your free will, but that's, you know, that that's not true. Right. Because God already knows that person will never have faith. Right. And, and, and he, yeah. the reason the elect act out as the elect should is because that's how God made them. Not that he made them that way. It's that he elected them before. So, so if someone, so a good example, like I like to point to is, um, the thief on the cross, right? The guy is, is mere hours away from dying. And then he looks to Jesus and says, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that guy right. goes straight to heaven. His entire life, he'd probably been a crook, right? Or been just immoral, the most moral person can think of. And he finds himself crucified for his sins. And he's right there next to Jesus. And he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So that guy was elected before the foundation right. of that the world. Moment, yeah. That moment was orchestrated. Uh, so he didn't, it's not he even didn't the turn right word to it. Uh -huh. it, I'm, I'm, I'm searching to find it, but he didn't, okay. he didn't come to Jesus because he had a come to Jesus moment. Uh, he came to Jesus because God had elected him before the foundations of the earth. Well, um, he came, yeah. And, and so he, yeah. he could not have done other than come to Jesus. This is, this is where the debate uh, always yeah. gets hairy. Uh, yeah. If you have been elected, even if you're a thief on the cross and you are minutes away from dying and you have lived the worst Hitler-esque life possible, you still may have been an elect person from the very foundations of the earth. And God made sure that before the moment uh, was passed that you would, in fact, have that changed heart. You don't have that changed heart because Jesus preached to you and you decided that sounds right to me. 
You have that changed heart because God decided to give you that heart transplant before you were born. Out of grace. Yes. yes. Always got to add out of grace because of grace. without that, it. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because out, without that. Yeah. This is this is the thing about the grace, though, and where where this all once again becomes highly toxic in, in debate forums. Um, and it becomes that question of and I'm oversimplifying it. I understand that. But did God elect you because of you or did he elect you because of him? Everyone agrees that election is grace. All right. So yes, we're not, we're not trying to take yeah. the grace out of it. But it, we're, when you say he elects me because I did the right things, mm -hmm. then, then grace just becomes transactional and you did the things to but, access the grace. Yeah. And God is paying you for something. It's like, oh, wow, I'm going to pay that person with grace, which nullifies the meaning of the word grace. Right. It's not, it's, not, it's not grace at that point. Uh, yeah, it's not. And grace. so I, in fact, could be a part of the elect. I could be. You, you got and all that means is I'm guaranteed that it's guaranteed that I'm not going to die right now. <laughs> because... <laughs> no, 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 no. So there's a danger there. There's a danger there of saying, okay, I'm guaranteed. So I'm, I can persist in, uh, I can persist in unbelief because, uh, in essence, you're kind of like, you know, like I'm just going to roll the dice with my life, you know, like, no, you know, no, I'm, never I'm, know, you know? I'm not right. No, no, no. But yeah, there's um, not a, there's not a danger in, in the narrow way that I mean it though. If I am one of the elect, if that is Correct. If my name is written in the book, it can't be unwritten. I can't unwrite it. So I am going to do that which God needs me to do, but not because I became smart enough to do it, but because the heart transplant will, will kick in. At, it, it, at, it will it'll have to come. Right? Yeah. God so have that's why, it, yeah. that's what I mean. If I am a part of the elect, I cannot die right now. Because it hasn't kicked well, in. Yeah, well, you, <laughs> if here's the I thing am... the danger. You don't. So here's here's the thing. No one like I can't look at you and be like, okay, you're you're definitely an elect person. I'm like, not saying that. Look at you I'm and, not saying that. Say, I just I just, yeah. I just I just want to make sure the argument has nice, clean, clear lines, so that when the debate starts online, we all we all understand the terms. If I am part of the elect, so you've got to take that on board first. That's that's if the are, hypothetical. Yeah. If I'm okay. a part of the elect. I cannot die right now. Cannot. You can't. You cannot die in unbelief. Correct. I, correct. And I am. I am in unbelief right now. And All right. If once again, if I am part of this, makes even Calvinists uncomfortable. I understand this. No, but I this am is, totally this comfortable is, with this. This is what yeah. the doctrine is saying. All right. Mm -hmm. If I am a part of the elect, I cannot die until I have that heart transplant, and I do actually act out in the things that God needs me to do and put on that cloak of righteousness and so forth. That right. is what, that is what happens. And it will not be because I suddenly wised up. Uh, so, so here's I, the thing. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Just, just to respond to that. It doesn't mean, okay, well, you know, like if I'm part of the elect, then, you know, so if let's say you get saved tomorrow, right. And then you look back at your life, you'll be like, Oh man, how did I not believe so long? after so long so it's not like you know it's like it's not like fire insurance you know like how uh, uh christianity is, is preached in america today it's mm -hmm. you know uh uh believe in jesus so you don't go to hell and that's it you know like yo do you want to go to heaven you want to go to hell and someone says i want to go to heaven okay uh say this prayer sign this card and now you're safe now you're good that's not that's not how the gospel is talked about in the new testament in the bible and so there's, the, the danger is that the Bible always talks about salvation as being today, a thing of today. Like today, if you hear his voice, do not harden mm -hmm. your heart because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know if there's going to be an earthquake tomorrow or whatever is going to happen. You're going to get, you know, you're going to yeah. collapse. And, and, and I think this is going to define the debate. I think this is going to define where the philosophical uh, issues clash. Because once again, uh, evangelism that's the thing that never made a lot of sense under Calvinism to me, because if you're evangelizing to someone oh, and you are trying sense. to, you're trying to, yeah. well, I'm, I'm going to say yeah. how I think it makes, makes sense because like I said, yeah. I've had a lot of time to think about it, but it's, it's the, yeah. I think it's the hardest part to understand. If you're evangelizing someone, 
um, and they are not the elect. You're wasting your time. Now, once again, you don't know that they're the elect. They don't know that they're yeah. the elect. This is this this uh, veil of ignorance is what keeps the whole thing going. But if you could yeah. poke through the veil of ignorance, and you could know for sure that a person was a part of the elect, you probably wouldn't need to evangelize to them. You, well, you would, here's the thing: the, God wants wants Christians to evangelize everyone. That's I, like he like that's the mandate. It's like when you when your boss tells you, "I want you to do these spreadsheets." I, I understand. I understand that, but <laughs> you know, yeah, I, but I need you to take on board this hypothetical again that you can poke through the veil of ignorance. That you can, uh, because okay. the the thing that makes evangelism work is we have a veil of ignorance, both sides. So the one evangelizing doesn't know if they're evangelizing to the elect and the one being evangelized doesn't know if they're elect. And so it could mm -hmm. be, and this is, this is kind of how you can logic your way through it. Um, God, the way that God makes manifest his, uh, the transitioning, the, the heart transplant is by people hearing the word. And that's how he's going to activate some people. Some that's people will some hear people, it yeah. and their, yeah. and their heart will be hardened. Right. But that's, but they were, that's all what they weren't a part of the elect anyway. The thing is, hang, hang on just a second. You as an yeah, evangelist okay. don't know, you don't know who in the audience is a part of the elect. So you have to give the message to everybody. And for those people who are to be activated with that living word, they will be activated through your effort of evangelism. And so God used you to give a message that uh, an elect person hears and the uh, and God then activates in some way. I know I'm using a lot of loose words here. Um, Technological words. Yeah. Yeah. The, the heart transplant and they get it. So that's that's the circle that's established. The problem for me is I see no reason for God to do that at all because he already knows who the elect is. You don't know who the elect is. It doesn't matter. He knows who the elect is. And so it seems like everything that we are doing here is just a play to be put on for his entertainment yeah. because he already knows. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. I just, yeah, yeah, sure. this is, yeah, no, this, I, I understand this is that, Calvinism, that, that man. Because, it's, um, because that's one of the big things that also kept me from it. I was like, wait, are we all puppets in this big dramatic play and the answer is to that is of course not because here's the thing uh when someone becomes a christian and they're like i want to tell the whole world about what just happened to me and they go out and they evangelize they evangelize they evangelize and, and they're appealing to people's wills they're like you know if you just believe you know and become a christian you know like god god's gonna save you he's gonna give you He's going to forgive all your sins and and he's going to reconcile you to himself and all these things and and the and the big and the big hurdle is like some people when they hear no from someone or someone tells me i'm not interested in that stuff please leave me alone is that they tend to get discouraged pretty fast they're like oh man did i say something wrong right they're like oh we did that did do i need to change my methods right. and, and the pitfall that has happened uh in evangelical america is that you see now that people have completely lost confidence in 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 preaching the gospel they've lost confidence confidence in telling people to repent and believe the gospel so they start changing the message or they start changing the presentation they're like now they have horses on stage or they have all these circuses happening because they're trying to woo people they're like oh let's appeal to your free will which that person doesn't have and so it's not it's not a play in the sense that uh, someone can, can can like the people who are evangelizing they're like oh well this is so like boring it's a benefit for the person evangelizing as well because again you not knowing your ignorance that's 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 what keeps you it, it's a guardrail to keep you from changing the message to make people feel happy so someone like joel osteen right you know him oh yeah, His, yeah. He, he fills a stadium every week like sixteen thousand people every week go to his church and i was listening to one of his sermons and he never mentions anything about repentance about jesus on the cross about like I'm, I'm not even making this up. He never mentions these things, but he's saying, "Hey, I'm preaching. I'm preaching from the Bible. I'm a Bible teacher." And the danger for him is that he's lost confidence 
in the fact that God uses this message of repent and believe in Jesus for salvation, all of salvation. He's lost confidence in that. He's like, people don't like that message. People want to hear uh, that they are fine, that they're good, that they're, you know, that they, can, they can be better. There are 10 steps to a better marriage, da, 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 da. So this, this guardrail that God has put in where we don't know who is elect and who is not elect helps keep the gospel message consistent so that the same way that someone is born again in the 21st century is the same way someone was born again in the third century in the first century uh abraham believed by faith he believed in god and was counted as righteousness it's the same way god god planned it that way that people are all brought into his fold in the exact by the exact same message so that's that's what i'd say that that's what i think the bible says about why god says go evangelize and you don't ha you don't have to know that's not your business you just go tell people christ is a great savior you're a sinner trust in him and he will be a great savior to you you don't have to worry about you know how is it going to balance out at the end of time or anything yeah so one of the strongest indirect arguments for calvinism uh is when jesus sent out the 70 and the 72 um to you know their first missionary uh journey if you will um and so part of his instructions is to you know go from house to house and what you do is you knock on the door and uh you know whoever answers it you are going to have this uh, spiritual connection you're gonna your spirit goes out of their spirit they will they will uh, if if it's received uh then go in and do your thing and if it's not uh just move on uh and you know if if uh, you know everyone in the city rejects you shake the dust off your feet and move on to the next one this is this is actually one of the strongest arguments for sounds very this, cold this though, un, right? <laughs> yeah well right but also very calvinist and that's in the sense that what jesus did not do he, what he never taught his disciples to do is uh be good sales people and learn how to overcome objections gimmicks yeah come up with These gimmicks were, like you're right there were there were no there was no um assignment to if someone rejects you, no, here's how to figure out what their real objection is. And here are the things that you can say to overcome their uh, objection and reestablish the cell. And so, no, it was none of that. Uh, there, was, there was no argumentation in well, what he sent them to do. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah. suggesting what they did. I'm just taking the, the scripture as it was. But the implication of this entire, of that, uh, that entire episode was uh, those who, are going to accept you are going to accept you in that spirit business uh and yeah. what you need to do is knock on the door <laughs> all right uh um, yeah. right and and then this and then the spirit will decide from there whether well, you go in or whether you go to the next house the spirit uh, decides if you see the fruit so you might go evangelize to someone and they'll be like get out of get out of here and then 20 years later they're like wait a minute the thing that guy told me yeah. <laughs> well, so right, but it, right. All I'm yeah. saying is at that yeah. moment, at the moment yeah. of knocking on the door, that it mm. wasn't an argument. It mm. wasn't a, uh, it was a, hi, I, Jesus sent me, you know, whatever, whatever their uh, opening hello was. And it was uh, the person saying, oh, well, come in. Uh, would you like some tea? Or it was get off my lawn. Wh whichever mm. it was, that's just what it was. Yeah, it's and, what it and, was. And they had to accept that it was God who was doing the picking and choosing. It wasn't their great ability to sell the product of salvation. So the thing is, it's not like you're selling something. It's you're, 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 you're proclaiming a message, right? You're proclaiming a message consistently. And that message has components to it that involve things like repentance, which a lot of people are like, I don't want to do that and belief. And other people are like, I can't do that. And so you, it, it keeps you, from you know altering the message and and, and that's that's a good thing right for, but the first when, when yeah. someone rejects you it's it becomes selling when you start overcoming objections you're just yeah, selling. if someone if someone rejects you and tells you i never want to talk to you again then you just you just leave them like you're like okay you're you're done alone. 
that doesn't you, mean that that person's that. not <laughs> going to be the elect. It doesn't mean yeah. that. It just means that they're not going to, that's not going to happen because of what you did at that moment in time. And maybe it does, but it's not going to happen right then. It doesn't matter whether it does or not because it wasn't you anyway. Yeah, and it frees you. It frees you to go out and and, and just and you're like free from uh, what's the, what's it called? Freedom of outcome, I guess. So it's like like when you're going to the gym and you're like, okay, I've been coming here for like six weeks and I see no results. A, a good personal trainer will tell you, just keep going, man. Don't don't give up. You know, like you just keep going. You don't you don't say, okay, because I'm not seeing results, then that means nothing's happening. Like something for sure is happening. And the temptation that happens in evangelical America is people are like, okay, no converts are happening. Let's change the message up, which is just so bad because you turn Christianity and this glorious gospel of good news and you turn it into another, yet another religion of do these things, do all that, or Christianity is keep the Ten Commandments and you're good. And that like, that's not what being a Christian is. It's not keep laws and then God will accept you. Yeah. It's God has done something for you. I, I think though, you know? I think yeah. though that there's a, there's a, a nuance to this that it might be being missed uh, because yeah. Jesus, there was never any, once again, we, we don't know what happened during the dark pages, but there was never anything on the actual written pages where Jesus said, okay, I want you to go back uh, to that city uh, that rejected you uh, next year. Uh, and do it again. Um, it was literally shake the dust off your feet. Forget th they're dead to you. Well, th there was a, there was an instance in, in Acts. I, I, I'm not remembering the exact chapter, but uh, Paul goes and preaches to the Corinthians, and they're like, "Nope, don't want to hear it." And then that same night, uh, Jesus tells Paul, "Like I have many people in this city. I can't think of the reference right now, uh, but." But Paul is discouraged because, you know, he preached and they're like, we don't want to hear about it. And then Jesus uh, encourages him and says, you know, uh, go back and preach because there are many people in the city. And a good example, actually, of this being played out in the early church is like when Stephen is being stoned, right? He preaches this long sermon, starts all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end. By the time he's done, people are picking up stones to, to kill him. And Paul is there. He's he's taking people's coats. He's like, give me the coats. This guy needs to die, right? And it's like, how, Stephen, how could he have known that this guy who was endorsing what was happening to him would end up writing half the New Testament? So, so it's it's not a it's not a okay. What what can I see is working, or what can I see is producing result? Is am I being faithful? to the gospel message that is unique from anything else in human history? Like that's that's what matters the most. Yeah. Okay. We stick a pin in it. Uh, I, would, yeah. I would, this would also be more after show fodder. Limited <laughs> atonement. Because God determined that certain ones should be saved as a result of God's unconditional election, he determined that Christ should die for the elect alone. All whom God has elected and whom Christ died will be saved. Okay. Uh, again, this is one where fist fights have started. I'm really going to be short with this one. I'm, okay. I'm going I'm to make up the <laughs> time <laughs> uh, yeah. because my bladder's full and I got to go pee. And I do these things in one take. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, Lunar Atonement, this one, this was sticky. So, again, uh, one of the differences between, um, uh, you know, real Calvinists, I would say, and, um, you know, more left-leaning Calvinistic um, people would be this. So on the one end of it would be uh, God chose those who were going to be saved before the beginning of time, before the beginning of creation. He, he wrote the names in the book and closed it. He doesn't have to open it again to recheck it. No new names are going in the book. There's nothing that is going to unfold in history that will put new names in the book. No names are coming out of the book. It's a limited set of people. So let's say it's a billion people. You know, I don't, I don't know the number. Let's play with the number. A billion people, that's it, throughout history, are going to be in that book. That's it. It's limited. And therefore, the gospel message went out to that limited group of people. Now, since the evangelists didn't know who that was, they had to go and preach the whole world. Okay, great. But the message would be many are called. The whole world is called. Few are chosen. 
that would be the limited uh, uh, number of people. Those are the people that the message was always going out to. Um, seeking and saving the lost. You're actually looking for the limited number of people for whom salvation uh, is appropriate. And the final thing on this, who did Jesus die for? This gets into, you know, real soteriology here. Uh, did Jesus die for everybody in the world? And so everybody in the world has the possibility of being saved if only they would answer the call. Or did Jesus die for the people he was only sent to die for, which is the elect limited number of people. So if you are not the elect, Jesus didn't die for you in the first place. Um, so he doesn't lose you uh, when you end up being lost. It, you're not really lost. That's probably even bad terminology. Uh, you're not lost. You were never his. Uh, when God says, when Jesus says, uh, you know, in the places in Matthew, I never knew you. Well, it doesn't mean that he didn't know that you were created. Uh, it means that you were never one of the people on his books. So all your good works didn't matter anyway. Uh, it, you weren't you weren't one of them. So that's this is where it just kind of gets pretty hard for people to wrap their minds around how this would be a good thing. Because if there is a limited atonement, how do you define it? Why on earth would God create a bunch of non-player characters in the first place? Why create the people? Who, oh, who the atonement doesn't go to. He knew who the elect was going to be. So he could have made the elect. Uh, why make the elect plus 7 billion other people or, you know, 6 billion other people uh, to go along with it? What's, what's the point of that? It would, they, it would, atonement was never for them. So why are they here? Um, it, again, it just kind of feels like a game because uh, we've got this veil of ignorance, but God doesn't. God knows who's going to be saved and who isn't. He knows who's in his book and who's not. Uh, and so you can say all you want. Well, the people who are a part of the limited atonement, there's, there are reasons for them to suffer and so forth and so on. They're, okay, but how does that explain the rest of us? Uh, I'm just putting me in the ones that aren't a part of the limited aton atonement. How does that explain why it's okay for me to suffer? Why am I even here? I don't want to be here. <laughs> I would rather not be right. here. I don't <laughs> so, want to be here. Um, so, uh, um, so anyway, limited tone is very problematic. Uh, uh, how do you, uh, understand it? What's the right way to think about limited atonement? All right. So, uh, we're pressed on time, so I don't think I'll be able to cover this extensively. So if anyone's listening and is like, they're interested, in, they can look up RC Sproul's, uh, uh, series when he he talks about uh, the doctrines of grace, the tulip, and he completely destroys the acronym because the acronym itself is not very very accurate in describing uh, what what the doctrines are. So that's one plug. The second plug uh, would be uh, watch Carl Sagan. Wow, never thought you'd hear that mm -hmm. from a Christian. Uh, watch Carl Sagan and uh, how he describes what a tesseract is. So I I'm not going to be able to explain it in that voice he does. But he's uh, he's very helpful in understanding this, in the sense that when it comes to uh, man's responsibility and God's election, how do these things work together, uh, and how like we we can know what a, that a four D object we can deduce that a four D object exists without actually seeing it. So here we have God's sovereignty, and then we also have uh, man's man's responsibility. So when it comes to limited atonement, um, the doctrine flows from the 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 uh the 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 biblical concept that uh the three the triune god father son holy spirit when they do something they always do something uh together so this was the argument that john owens put up now, now i'm being philosophical obviously i could go the biblical route but i i i just don't have enough time and i don't think uh like we, we just don't have enough time so philosophically it goes like this okay the father elects some uh, the Holy Spirit does not indwell everyone, right? The Holy Spirit only indwells people who are born again and are Christians. So you have the Father doing uh, a specific thing in salvation for specific people, and you have the Holy Spirit doing the same thing for uh, specific people in salvation. And so the the big the big question is how can you have Jesus, the Son, doing something that's different from the Father and the Spirit? Like it creates a disharmony in the Trinity because you have the Father electing some and then Jesus dying for everyone and then the Spirit only indwelling some. So it, it ends up putting it 
in terms of like, okay, Jesus, Jesus spilled his blood in vain because unless you're a universalist, you believe that you people are going to go to hell. Um, and so it becomes, okay, Jesus died for their sins. Jesus paid for their sins. Okay. So why is anyone in hell? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, like he paid for their sins on the cross, like God's wrath was satisfied on the cross. So when God sends someone to hell, it's like, why are they in hell? Jesus died for them. And so if you see the atonement that way, as the Bible talks about it, then you'll be like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Um, and the other thing, wow, I just lost it, is that we're not, we, we, we don't concern ourselves with like, oh my, am I elect or not elect? Like the atonement is not offered to someone either as elect or non-elect, but as a man, a human being, or as a and, and as a sinner. So, okay, are you a human being? Yes. Are you a sinner? Yes. Then Christ died for you. So there's a guy named Rabbi Duncan who said, the Bible says Christ died for sinners. Rabbi Duncan is a sinner. Therefore, Christ died for Rabbi Duncan. So you see, it's it's not that you can you can <laughs> you can write yourself out of the Bible and say because I don't believe then it's possible Jesus didn't die for me because that's that's one of those uh, thought patterns that are kind of just keeping you. They're just keeping you from believing. You're like, maybe I'm not even saved. Why would I want to be saved? If maybe I'm not, why would I want to be in vain? Uh, have a faith that's in vain. But that's the wrong way to think about it. Uh, instead, you should think of it in the way the Bible puts it. Into, like the ball is, is in your court in a way. Like what are you looking at? What are the facts that you know? You're a sinner. Yes. Christ says he dies for sinners. Yes. Christ says, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden. Yes. All right. If I go to Christ, he'll save me. Yes. Therefore, Christ saved me. It's not more, okay, let's try and figure out what God's eternal book, what God's diary says. You know, <laughs> you can't you can't reach up to the heavens and take a peek and see if my name is there. But when you believe, you get that assurance that you are saved by God. And so particular redemption or limited atonement, if you want to call it that. Um, and to just summarize it, it just, it just says this. If you're looking for a good sentence, this is it. It says Christ's atonement is sufficient for the whole world, sufficient for the whole world, and it's efficient for the elect. In other words, Christ's death is, is, is enough to cover the whole world, but it's effective, it's efficient for the elect, sufficient for the whole world, efficient for the elect, if you trust in him and believe in him, Christ's uh, uh, propitiatory death on the cross uh, assuages God's wrath on you. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one, but I got to yeah. tell you, I this, this is another one where I just want to do an hour. Um, oh, wow. So uh, if we had done an after show here, it would have been five hours long uh, already. <laughs> so, uh, comments, skeptics and seekers dot squarespace dot com. Log in your discuss account, discuss away. Uh, send me an email, and I will uh, find a way to uh, for us to do some email sharing so that Matt uh, Matt can also uh, get on the email fun. Uh, skeptics and seekers at gmail dot com. The I into it irresistible grace those whom god elected he draws to himself through irresistible grace god makes man willing to come to him when god calls man responds okay this one seems the most straightforward of all yes um if if you are a part of the elect you gonna answer when god calls uh period so uh, let's just say saul of tarsus he was part of the elect he was clearly not saved when God called him, but when he did, Paul did not, in fact, have the option to say, eh, no. He couldn't, he couldn't have said no. Actually, people talk and debate about this and say, if he said no, and then later on God called him like throughout the rest of his life, but he just kept kept saying no, 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 no. Um, but ultimately, he could have said he could have said no because God like appeared to him in a way it's like it was unmistakable for him. I was like, right. okay, yes, he couldn't have said no. But in to, in to the way Christ. that Paul couldn't say no, none of the elect could say no. Now, not every elect is going to be an apostle, but they couldn't say no. And so, if if and once again, we have this veil of ignorance, so we don't really know if we're res responding as part of the elect or not, but this kind of makes it 
a, a fair statement almost, almost, that if you were, you thought you were saved, but you left the faith, then you were not. Because um, God's call is irresistible. And if you can right. resist it, yeah. you didn't get it. <laughs> so um, yeah so i was i was watching a video of that girl that you were uh reviewing i think her name is christy burke um uh, the, you did a video on, on a girl who mm -hmm. was saying oh deconstructing the bible right yeah and yeah. i was watching her video I've, I've been i've been trying to get her on the show i i, I like her a lot <laughs> so, wait has she responded yet no <laughs> Uh, she probably thinks I'm a super, creepy stalker, super, super but famous, like 50, 50k <laughs> subscribers. My goodness. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I was watching her video and she was talking about this and she was saying like, you know, I grew up going to church, got baptized as a baby, you know, like in front of the whole congregation. And she like pretty much like even listening to her, honestly, um, there, there's definitely such a thing as Christianese. You can tell someone who's uh, was definitely brought up in a Christian home just by the way they talk and how they inflect their voice. It's just so apparent. Um, but the thing is, like, when it comes to irresistible grace, it doesn't mean that uh, you you don't have a say in the matter. Like, uh, the best the best analogy for this, and, and I don't know if you've heard of this before, but I, if you haven't, I hope this is helpful, is that when Jesus is raising Lazarus from the dead right like use this as an analogy for how people become saved so what needed to happen for jesus to raise lazarus from the dead and then call him out so jesus had to have raised him from the dead right like he was mm -hmm. dead he was in there rotting um and covered in so jesus had to say had to raise him first right had to bring him back to life and then he said lazarus come out come out so for lazarus to come out of the grave he had to be alive first and for him to respond, like he couldn't have said, you know, Lord, I like being dead. <laughs> you know, like I like being in the tomb. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'll stay in here. So irresistible grace is pretty much saying, like, when God brings you from spiritual death to spiritual life, you won't stay in the tomb. You won't be like, I like living here in this cozy tomb. You'll say, I want to come out to the lights. Right. I want to. Sounds, I wanna it sounds like yeah. you're. I mean, I just want to keep you from backtracking at all or seeming to backtrack because i know this is very uncomfortable uh it, lazarus didn't lazarus didn't have a choice he uh, didn't well he, he could have you mean he like yeah so that's a, that's the a point i'm making could he have said i want to stay in this tomb like no, no like that's not a rational choice to make he he couldn't have made the choice not because he couldn't physically but he just it doesn't make sense to i don't him. think it would have been a possible choice i don't i don't think that lazarus i don't think it, it that jesus been. call would have allowed for lazarus to rise and say yeah but jesus i'm just not into you and i'm going to stay here i but don't you know, think some people, that some people say that that's what happens some christians say that you know jesus himself can come and call you salvifically and you can say no thanks right that's but the what, reason that's the what, reason yeah. those just conversations are just wrong headed on both sides is because if jesus calls you that will not be a choice this is this is the doctrine of irresistible uh grace if you can say no and have it stick until you die you were never called it's that simple right <laughs> right yeah yeah so, so that's why when when people get offended people get offended and you say like okay well I, did, I i grew up listening to hymns when i was in the womb you know or something like i grew up in the church and stuff and then and then you say you know like uh, you know according to what the bible says it says you know like you didn't really hear jesus voice and it's like it's so offensive oh my goodness uh, it just drives people up a wall like and people yeah, are it, very it emotional about it. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And under so, Calvinism, it shouldn't. I and so I, I perfectly right. acknowledge that. <laughs> okay, so. all right. So that's why, like, it shouldn't drive you up a wall because right. it's just saying, like, of course, okay, you you know, at least at some level, and uh, not at the at the deep, deep, deep spiritual level, that needs to happen. That this is what that Jesus is calling out to you, and he's saying, Lazarus. So, like, how many times did Jesus call out? You know, like you remember, like if like like if you're sleeping, and you hear like when you're called for the first time, it's like you just hear a noise in the distance. You hear whoa, whoa, and then eventually the 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 noise becomes clearer and clearer, and you hear your name. You hear David, David. So the call right now, like if someone is preaching the gospel to you or telling you what the gospel is, 
you're just hearing some vague shout. Being saved is when the shout gets closer and closer and closer and closer and you hear your name specifically and you're like, wow, I have to respond to this because Lazarus, like he was brought back to death and then he heard Jesus' voice because Jesus was his friend and, yeah. and he was like, okay, I know who's calling me. It's not some random vague thing over yeah, there. I think I'm it's, being a better Calvinist than you in this. Uh, Jesus doesn't have to call twice. Uh, okay, well, I, I think he I mean, did it anyway. It's, it's Lazarus come out and you come out. And, and that's, and I would, I would just kind of make the Calvinist argument this way. Uh, you actually don't know that. So two, two, two sides of this, you believe that you were a Christian because God called you and you responded to the call, but you don't actually know that. You you may have become religious through some secular means, but you never heard the call of God. Uh, so that's that's a possibility under Calvinism, uh, or for, for that matter, under anything. But um, secondly, let's say you did get the call of God. As a Calvinist, you can't say, "Well, you're not a Christian because you walked away," because I'm not dead. Uh, so I might I might in fact be one of the elect, and part of my journey is to be rebellious until i can't everyone's journey is being rebellious like well i mean i mean, the, I mean you, after getting John the baptist uh -huh. af after getting the call so let's just kind of tear up the analogy that i just uh put neatly together a moment ago uh if lazarus had said okay i'm alive thanks but i've really made a nice home in this tomb i like it it's dark i don't like people i'm gonna stay here thanks bye uh he couldn't he have, yeah, yeah he was still gonna come out all right. So right. even even if his journey had been, I think I'll stay here for a while. He's still going to come out uh, because he's Jesus like, told he's, him like to come out. he's like he's in a tomb, right? He'll realize. Wait, it's like the prodigal son. He's like, wait a minute, you know, right. like I'm I'm out here eating pig food. Why why should I have to eat pig food? And exactly. He goes back to his father, so expecting, it, yeah. We can't say that uh, once again under Calvinism. I don't I don't need the nasty grams. The we Bible. can't say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, we were called and we walked away because we can't say for sure that we responded to God's that you actual were call. Responding to God's, uh, like you, like his, his, his salvific call. Of, exactly. Now you're like, that's Jesus. He's called me. I know right. I am his forevermore. Something right. Like and, that. and no one else can say that we are not elect because we walked away yes no one yeah if, if you've heard someone tell you you're not elect, that person is a liar like they're just they don't know what they're talking about you that's not information that anyone has at right. all ever so this is this is going to bleed into my closing arguments which will uh, come up but it's every every part of this process every one of these points uh is dependent on what i keep uh, incorrectly because of the philosophical idea but the veil of ignorance this whole veil of ignorance idea um it's all about what we don't know that's what makes the logic of calvinism possible. and we don't yeah we don't know a lot you know like yeah. like deuteronomy 29 29 says god has secrets like you you can't, you can't uh, like if god has secrets then like our minds like you like again carl sagan i'm going to reference him uh, he says we can't even fathom what a 4D object would look like. Yeah. Much more, how can we fathom an infinite God? And, and he has revealed certain things to us, like things that are in 3D and sometimes in 2D. So the problem with like people who are so anti-Calvinist where they say, well, if God is planning everything, then that means God is responsible for evil. Uh, that's my be best uh, Lane Flowers voice, <laughs> is that they're flattening it out. They're trying to make it that God exists among us in this this uh, cause and effect world where everything okay, cause effect, cause effect. But God is not in the same plane as us. So you can't. So so God says you're responsible, and He also says I'm sovereign. And God can say that because He doesn't inhabit this restricted form of 3D-ness where we're like, okay, if I drop this pen, it's gonna drop because of gravity, like cause effect. God inhabits a plane where he can sovereignly decree things and we can also be responsible for our actions. And so the irresistible grace is a comfort for Christians because if you hear the voice of Christ calling you and you're like, wow, that's the promises here that God has made for those who are his, 
then you can rest in that salvation knowing that he'll never like you can't wonder like oh maybe was it was i uh uh hallucinating or was i or did i read the bible wrong it's it's the objective word of god that keeps you and the holy spirit granting these truths in your heart that keep you in the faith and keep you from looking to yourself for salvation by looking to god yeah okay uh audience i'm so sorry i'm not going to touch any of that uh so uh it's the comments you know what to do um as much as my bladder is going to hate me for saying this we have finally gotten to the p perseverance of the saints the precise ones god has elected and drawn to himself through the holy spirit will persevere in faith none whom god has elected will be lost they are eternally secure question okay so uh preservation preserve perseverance of the saints which i actually even though it's not a p prefer eternally secure uh, because it makes it sound like if you had a legitimate call that you couldn't fall away. And that is not true. You can fall away as far as you want to. But if you have been called, you, as we talked about the last time, you will respond uh, in the in the due time that you are supposed to. That much is irresistible. So uh, it it simply means that all that God has called, he will bring forth. Um, I, I think it was, uh, said at one point, uh, you know, to, to Jesus, none, none that I have given you will be lost. Uh, and I don't think that applies just to the, the 12, because in fact, um, Judas was lost. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think that we can look at it as narrowly as that. I think that we have to, uh, look at that as in all of the elect whom uh who, who are washed in your blood are going to persevere uh in the end they are going to be uh, they're going to be eternally uh secure uh and i i prefer, I prefer the term on pre, pre, preservation preservation they're going to be preserved so again this uh this goes back to language and how um in the reformed tradition like our emphasis in what is in what god does and and we put that at the foreground instead of the background because if you put uh perseverance which is like it's fine right perseverance of the saints whatever it, it it kind of implies that the persevering itself is because of something that you do so lots of christians like struggle with uh whether they're saved or not and they're like you know like i really i really messed up the other day so am i really saved and that's a legitimate question to ask um, but it's, it's a question that you ask, um, in light of what Christ has objectively done. It's not a question that you ask where you're looking at your performance uh, and saying, well, well, last week I did this amount of good works and, um, and then I did some bad things. So I'm good for the week. It's always going to be what Christ did. So if you ask someone, uh, why do you think, uh, you're a Christian and they say, because I did this or because I believed or because I have faith or because I researched or because I grew up in a Christian family, that person has already taken a wrong turn uh, because the only hope that anyone has of making it into heaven is the, is the same hope that um, the thief on the cross had. So for him, that guy never had to do a Bible study in his life. He never... <laughs> He never had to go to prayer meetings. He never had to do soup kitchen work. He never had to do evangelism, except maybe to the guy next to him. He 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 died and he goes to heaven and he's like, Okay, why are you here? And the only answer he could give was because Jesus said I could come. The man in the middle cross said I could come. And that's the message of the gospel that that because Christ has accomplished salvation fully, uh, and it's all by grace, then you go to heaven. Now, there's a danger in that, no? because this is such a dangerous dialectic to give to people, because people hear grace, and they're like, oh, so that means I can live life how I want. And you say, well, no, you can't, because if you've been saved by grace, then that means that your entire life is is, is like you are in, you're, you're grateful, and you want to be like the person who saved you. So your life can't look like what you used to be like when you weren't saved. So you don't live your life as 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 
before where you're just blinded or you're not or or you're trying to uh, self-justify yourself or you're steeped in self-righteousness you live your life in uh, in a desire to be like christ so that's why good works are essential not as the basis but as the fruit so this dialectic is very hard to get across to people because you tell someone you, you're pushing grace to someone right pushing grace and they're like well wh why should i even try right and right. you're like wait no 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 and then you start pushing works to someone and they're like wait so that it means i'm saved by works or i have something to do with it and that's also right. wrong so it's it's Sorry. such a unique uh uh a dialectic to to to, to give someone and it's and it's why it's what makes the gospel unique in and of itself right so i'm gonna once again be a better calvinist than you and not give a damn about the dialectic uh because here's the thing um yeah. you know you should you should not retreat from this uh as a calvinist okay. um you literally can't pr pr preservation or or uh, what is the word you use uh, perseverance pr perseverance uh, of the saints preservation of the saints is should not be mistaken for performance of the saints mm. uh, and you and no one else on earth gives you a performance review uh so if you were if you did something you you hauled off and you killed a person because you you know they looked at you funny and now you're wondering if you're saved you have you too have missed the point uh yeah. so you don't even get to review your own behavior there you are saved or not uh, not based on whether you killed a person. Uh, heck, God may have needed you to kill that person. I don't know. That's it. Not you shouldn't even think about that. You can repent. Your your heart is is uh, sorrowful, and that's great. That may be a, a good sign, but it's not a it's not a condition of salvation whether you killed somebody or not. So you should not be thinking to yourself, "Oh well, if I didn't kill someone, then I would be saved." No, you wouldn't. Uh, or yes, you would. It, it but it has nothing to do with that bit of performance. And so I understand the dialectic challenge because when you say things like this, it does make people uh, maybe go off uh, on on bad tangents. But once again, that's, yeah. that's because they don't understand Calvinism. It's not yeah. because Calvinism is not stated well. I think that Calvinism, Calvinism actually gets confusing when people try to make a dialectic that's easier to follow. I don't think you should do that. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Um, even tulip is not a good it's not a good summary honestly yep i do think it is a like i said before a very muscular uh view of grace though and so every piece of tulip has to be there it it makes sense for it to be there to have this uh level of grace and so yeah perseverance perseverance of the saints you have to um persevere you okay you you won't because the grace is irresistible you can't resist it and so when uh you know when paul says um how how what should we say then should we continue and send that grace may abound the answer is not no as paul stated the answer is you can't you can't the answer is you shouldn't continue. you shouldn't even be asking you, that you question. shouldn't even be asking the question that's right because yeah. the, the fact of the matter is if god has called you and if god has in fact given you the heart transplant you won't it's it's like, just, so it's not even it's it's if i can make a, a kind of a crass gross example here um you know i can say now that i'm no longer two years old um you know, I'm, I'm an, a grown ass adult and I can do whatever I want. Does that mean I can still pick floaters out of the bathtub and eat it? Um, I'm sorry, grossing you one out, but you were two before and you took baths. Shut up. Um, so, I'm, I'm saying is, you know, here, here's the thing. We don't eat poop voluntarily because we don't want to. We don't want to. We've grown out of a stage where that would even be appealing. We don't eat dirt because we don't want to. That's not even a appealing to us as a fully functioning uh well-balanced adult in this world and so the question of well should you continue in sin so that grace may abound is as silly as asking well should i eat poop uh because i'm an adult and i can do whatever i want to just try it you want to no you don't yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, so it's not even it. that's not even a question that makes sense but that's what uh, uh, we're falsely accused of, of teaching people, uh, you know, like all these uh, three hour videos uh, on, on 
on YouTube about how Calvinism is against Christianity is that, you know, is that we're teaching people like, hey, if you're saved, you can just sit on the couch and do whatever you want and live life how you want because, hey, you're saved, right? And it's like, no, man, just, 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 yeah, just I would actually, I would lean into that though. I would say, yes, man, you can do whatever you want to if you are in fact a part of the elect because what but you would if, want to, you because do, what you would want yeah. to do is what your changed heart should do. Should and so, do. Right, right. Okay. so if you don't want to do good things, that may be a good sign that you don't have a change heart. So the, the fact is elect people can do, in fact, they have to do, they should do exactly whatever they want to, because they have the change heart to want to do the things of their father. That's what I mean. You should eat as much poop as you want right? Which is zero. <laughs> That's how much you're going to eat. And you should commit as many sins as you want if you got to change heart, which is zero, because you actually, you are going to be constantly purified, not just justified, but purified and sanctified because you have had the transitioned, transplanted new heart, creating me a new heart. You've got that new heart. Guess what? You don't even want to smoke anymore. It, that that heart doesn't even crave it. What do you do? What are you talking about? Is it okay for me to continue to smoke with this new heart? You fool! <laughs> you did. You well, went full Galatians. So yeah. Maybe you should go back uh, to the doctor because he gave you. You got an artificial transplant. All right, that's not actually a real heart. Um, that's that's not the good heart. So um, I would just say that you know Calvinists should stop running away from the 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 language. That oh, has we gotten don't the, the, I mean, but I'm just saying there's this kind of almost this cringe, this pre cringe that a kicked dog does, <laughs> yeah, you know, because they, they you see know you coming and yeah, so they cringe the, the, before the, the kick fear comes. Of, uh, of legalism, right? That people yeah, are like, right. people are so afraid of saying, people, okay, you have to now you have to obey God's law. And people are like, whoa, that's legalism, right? You say, Wait, you, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> yeah, when you when you try to fix the language, you actually make Calvinism more confusing. It's it's actually simpler to understand if you it's, just it's lean like into all the stuff that people hate. Just lean into it because that's the simpler version. Oh, so, so the thing is, we I we I don't want people to hate it. I want people to embrace it. But like I realize, just because of limitations of all kinds, like if you if you've been watching Latent Flowers for the past five years every week, then there's just so many things we need to get out of the way for you to accept it. And so like getting, getting the limitations is, is a huge challenge in and of itself. But like, we have to, we have to put the guardrails there because like Paul does it. He says, so because I've been preaching about, he's been talking about grace in Romans and other people are like, oh, so does that mean we should sin? So grace may abound. He's like, no, by no means. Uh, if you've been raised by Christ, you would want to be like him. Like Christ does not do immoral things. You want to be like Christ. So you want to live a moral upstanding holy righteous life like he did you'll strive for that and he's going to help you along the way by the power of the holy spirit and you're not just going to be figuring out for it for yourself because it's grace all the way from beginning all the way to the end christ the father the spirit are all there on your side if god is for us who can be against us that's what being a christian is like you have uh, the triune god on your side and he's helping you, he's helping make you into who you're meant to be uh, so that you can uh, you can be the freest person you could be because being free means doing whatever you want and not having to suffer in hell for it. Uh, that's what freedom, true freedom is, um, doing what you want and not having to be second guessing yourself. Like, should I really be doing this right now? You know, uh, that's what freedom is in Christ. Right. So, uh, look, uh, things to uh, say and add and rejoin, but we're going to stop here. I'm going to give my uh, closing remark, which I will make very brief, and I will give you the last word. Uh, and uh, so before I say that, because you probably don't have a good pattern for this, uh, make sure to... Uh, <laughs> Leave a comment. Skepticsseekers.squarespace.com. Log in your discuss account. Discuss away. I don't think that leaving comments is going to be a problem <laughs> this week. I think that we're going to get a lot of it. I hope. Uh, I hope people like we like. I hope like my genuine hope is that people are like, oh, I learned something new.
or yeah. I didn't think of it like that. Yeah. But here's the thing: it doesn't matter. Uh, if, know, we'll as a Calvin, as a Calvinist, <laughs> I just I I can't believe I'm being a good Calvinist. Uh, you said just a minute ago. Uh, look, but I want people to like it. No, wrong. I don't care. You take your I, I out of the way. Take your I desire. F I no, yeah, that's the problem. Take it out of the way. Um, God didn't give you a message so that people would like it. He gave you well, a message to present. I hope they would like it. It, it doesn't matter. No, stop yes, it. It does. No, it, it does doesn't. Matter. Doesn't matter because, because if I presented it faithfully and someone is, uh, if is you presented it faithfully, that, that makes me. If you present it faithfully, then you're going to be stoned to death in a town square. Uh, okay. That's, that's <laughs> so you have to get out of this idea because this is how Joel Joel Osteen no, got into his the, problem. That's the only way he, he that's wanted the only to way preach to do evangelism. It, he <laughs> wanted to preach a gospel that people liked, and you you shouldn't worry about what people think about the truth of Calvinism if it's I true. There's so much. Because this is this is a big stumbling block, especially for uh, our generation. It is not a stumbling block like, to the it, elect. You, I, it is. They can, no, like, it's they not. Can be against, yes, it is. Like uh, for twenty, like so for twenty years, like someone is like, I hated Calvinism. You imagine how 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 toxic they were never <laughs> supposed to. They were never supposed to come to that that election before I, then. I, I don't I don't see it in that fatalistic sense of like. Well, I guess they were never supposed to. Like if if you're like you know like if you if you plant a mango seed and you're like, oh, I hope I hope that mango seed sprouts. You're not I, like, well, it could be anything. It's I just I just I just want you to think about this. Just read. Just think about this carefully, because this is actually a. Um, a thought technology that I had even as a kid, uh, a, a child preacher, is that if I'm going to be faithful to, uh, if I'm going to be faithful to the mission and to the word, it can't, I cannot want people to like me. Oh, uh, that's and totally different. I can't, man. I can't want that. What I have to want is to be able to accurately and clearly present the word. And if that gets me killed, that get fine, cool. I don't. Yes. I don't need to be accepted uh, yeah. to be yeah, clear they, and true. It, you there's know, there's a danger in that, and and I say that because I find myself in, in the vortex of uh, street preachers, <laughs> who I see like I see people acting like the biggest jerks imaginable okay. on the street, and I'm like, please stop doing that, even though. <laughs> they're preaching 95 percent of street preachers preachers are mentally ill i'm just going to say that i'm going to put open, that out there open air up, open air preaching yeah i look i made up that statistic i understand it but i think it's low um i think okay. you can do it in a good way you can you can make it work but the thing is that the people that i watch who do it they're just doing it and they have the mentality of like i don't care if you hate me in fact some people like they want people to hate them they're just being inflammatory <laughs> and they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to get rewarded in heaven because I'm being persecuted. No, you're being persecuted because you're being a jerk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> John, the John the Baptist was cracked and everybody who follows him is what stuff are too. All right. Look, there, uh, there's a debate. Right, we don't right. even have time uh, for this. Uh, I'm just lobbing grenades for no reason now because I've got him in no my pocket and I have not, I haven't had a chance John to the Baptist use him. Was the nicest, he was the nicest guy, by the way, but okay. <laughs> what, am, what am I going to do with these unexploded grenades? I got to throw them. Uh, uh, right here at the end. Anyway, here's what. <laughs> so, uh, guys, you know what to do. Skeptics and Seekers dot uh, Squarespace dot com. Log in your discuss account. Discuss away. Send us an email at Skeptics and Seekers at gmail dot com. My uh, last word, last thought. Everything that I've said that kind of makes Calvinist Calvinism uh, remotely uh, logical and and cohesive depends on one thing it depends on god knowing everything and us knowing nothing it depends on this veil of ignorance this set of assumptions and these presumptions that cannot be penetrated cannot be falsified uh you simply have to trust in all of the things that you can't know and see and god and you have to believe also that god set it up that way so that uh, evangelists can't know uh, if they're talking to someone who's saved or not. The people that are being evangelized can't know whether they're being saved or not. No one, no one can know uh, 
exactly what's going on. And so really the only one who can sit back and enjoy the play is God because he orchestrated it all in some way or another. Look, don't let the dialectic uh, fool you. You've heard us uh, talk for two hours on this, so you know what I mean. Um, and I think that any, any religion, any worldview, any philosophy that depends on the ultimate ignorance of the adherents is problematic at best, bad at worst, and at the absolute worst, must be religion. Uh, Matt, uh, Mac, not <laughs> Matt, uh, Mac, uh, your last words there. All right, closing statement. All right, so uh, ignorance has been brought up as a negative. I don't think it's ignorance. So for, for instance, we teach our children, hey, don't, if you tell them don't touch the stove, and they 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 talk back and they're like, why did you tell me to do that? Then that that child is um, uh, they're they're displaying that like, maybe they're they're just I don't know they're curious. They'll be like, why why daddy should I not touch the stove? You can, and you can say, okay, well because you'll get burnt. And there are other things are like, well daddy, I want to watch that show, and you're like, well can't watch it. Why? Well you just gotta trust me on this one. And so, like, uh, the biggest the biggest thing that comes with uh, people not not embracing that God is God and we are not is the is the desire or perhaps the inclination to bring God down to our level and say that hey, uh, an infinite God should be able to explain everything to me, a finite being who has lived for a couple of decades. I don't think that's uh, it's logical. Um, I also don't think, uh, as, at least from the biblical point of view, that when it comes to the talk of salvation, that we are we are doing a good thing by telling people, you know, it's it's all dependent on you. Because if it is, even if, like you say to someone, it's dependent on your free will, then the the perseverance will also have to depend on them. So, at best, if someone is truly saved. And they're constantly looking it to themselves for help. They'll always be wondering, am I truly saved? Um, they'll always be questioning their salvation. And the Bible doesn't leave us in a position where we're, uh, we're, 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 we're second guessing. Like, am I really saved? Am I really saved? Although it does tell us to work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling, uh, and that's what faith is. Faith is casting yourself to an infinite God who loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son who paid the penalty of your sin, right? Penalty that happened in the past, uh, which means all your sins are forgiven. But it doesn't end there. It comes into the present and it says, okay, because grace has appeared in the form of Jesus, that grace transforms your life. And that's why you have future hope that one day you will be free from the presence of sin. So penalty of sin was paid for in the past. You're being rescued from the power of sin in the present. You'll be rescued from the presence of sin in the future in heaven. That's what salvation is in its totality. It's not simply a get out of a hell free card. It's much more than that. It's being brought into reconciliation with a holy God who has opened uh, the gates of heaven to sinners now. So um, are you a sinner? Do you need salvation? Christ is offering salvation. That's what the gospel says. It says, if you come to him, he will give you rest. It's not a question of how much can I understand? It's a question of uh, casting yourself wholly on Christ and relying on him for salvation. And the doctrines of grace, uh, Calvinism, puts that in a systematic way, like, hey, it could totally be wrong. Like, I don't know. It could be. But all I know is that grace starts it and grace ends it. And that is the only way anyone <laughs> can be assured that they are saved because of God's grace. Because Jesus said, uh, you can go. Like he said to the thief on the cross, you will be in paradise. That's the same message he gives to all who believe. So that the work is done outside of you. And it's not something that you have to introspect, but you have to only look to Jesus and his finished objective work and be saved. That's the only way sinners are going to be reconciled with God and live with him forever. 
Okay. Um, so uh, I, I should let the show just end right there. It's a great speech. It's it's weird. I've had evangelist people on the show, but I never got altar calls. Uh, the show is going in with an altar call every week. I'm make sure you have the last word every week. That's, that's, that's very, uh, it's very interesting. You're good at it. You should do more of that. Um, that's, hey, I told you, I, I told you about it in the email. Yeah, no, it's that's, not even, it's not even an altar call. It's just, this is what, this is what Christianity is. It's just what we call it. It's just an altar call, but yeah, but no, it's, it's I, okay. um, I just want to, I just want to say additionally, because I don't think I'm going to say it enough throughout the course of the run of the time that we are co-hosts, whatever that is, because eventually we'll burn out. Uh, I'll get replaced by somebody who's going to replace me. Um, maybe, maybe Clint. <laughs> That would, that would be very interesting. Baby oh, no, I've, I'm very replaceable. I'm looking for anybody wanting to replace me now. Uh, I'll, I'm taking applications. If you even took the time to fill one out, you win. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but I just want to say, um, these are the kinds of conversations that I have looked forward to having and that that I, I felt like, you know, we, I've explored a small corner of Christianity. Uh, but there's always a way of saying, yeah, but you haven't explored this corner of Christianity or that corner of Christianity and having you on the show. Yeah. There's some, some, something strategic there because it's a, a type of Christianity, a version of Christianity that I haven't really got to, uh, explore in super serve. And so it, uh, allows, uh, for us to, to get broader uh, in the Christianities that we explore because it becomes easy to just argue against one kind of Christianity. You, you get to know it very well, but it's, yeah. a, it's a lot more challenging when you, when you branch out a little bit further. But the other thing, uh, the other reason I wanted, uh, you on the show is very self-serving, very straightforward. Uh, and it's hard for a lot of people to understand and that's okay. Uh, but it is that, of all the of the interactions we had on the board and have on the board of all of that, I could always see that we would get along very well if we just talked to each other, <laughs> that, that this, this kind of, um, enmity, uh, that builds up online is mostly shallow and that, that we would actually have very good conversations that have benefit uh, beneficial to everybody if we just got past all that and forced ourselves to talk to each other and i've been wanting to do it for a while and um i really appreciate you coming along and Thanks making that me. possible and you know anytime people listen to one of these shows and they think wait, wait a minute aren't they aren't they in a death match on the board well yeah but no <laughs> and and never really have been as far as I'm concerned. And this is the, this is the interaction that I always knew we could have. And I've, I am gratified and, um, uh, validated that we can have these kinds of interactions, uh, because it's, it's what I foresaw would happen. And so it's happened. So I guess I'm a prophet. Maybe I'm the elect. I'm the elect. Anyway, it doesn't. <laughs> so, folks, this last two hours uh, plus, uh, we have gone through two minutes and 40, what is it? Two minutes and 46 oh, seconds man. of a video. Oh, okay. This was, this is a 13 minute long video. We two went through minutes. two minutes yeah. and 46 seconds. We're going to take the other 11 minutes next week. How long will that show be? <laughs> By the time we get to the end of the video, like the rapture will have happened or something. Yeah. It's honestly a good video too. So uh, folks do me a favor. Don't listen to the whole video because we're really going to finish. <laughs> we're really going to finish this. And uh, my favorite part of the video, even though there's a middle section with, I can't remember the, I don't the preacher's name who does most of the uh, section. It's Steve Lawson. And then it's John MacArthur. Yeah. John, I actually really liked J Max 
uh, portion of this. And so I look forward to. Uh, He's uh, yeah, I mean, he he does bring a good point, and in a sense, like people wouldn't unless unless you're one of those people who's just very anti-Calvinist, you wouldn't you wouldn't even know it until you you, know, you think about it. Yeah, no, I I think I think he um had a very powerful segment um here, and so I'm looking forward to it. But look, I just I knew that the tulip was going to take a little while. Um, to uh to get through and i and it's foundational so if we're going to be able to successfully talk about the the other 11 minutes of this video we had to to set some foundation here and so um so we did that and uh so until next time we'll see you in the comments in the meantime we are out goodbye